Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Wherever you are joining us from today, we are glad that you are worshiping God with us. We continue to worship online during this time of COVID-19, and we are glad that we are able to continue worshiping God together, but separately. If you are a member or friend of the congregation, you should have received communication this week that the church session has met and we will be reopening the church for public worship on Sunday, September 13th. This was a decision that was finally made uh, for us to come back together and we are grateful that we are able to come back together at this time. We will be coming back, however, with a bit of a change in setup and precautions. There will be expectations uh, for all of us to follow, including wearing a mask and physically distancing from one another. And so you will be receiving more information about those items as well. We will be asking you to make a reservation beginning on the Wednesday before worship, and that will be necessary so that we can know who is here and so that we can also um, be able to maintain physical distancing standards in the sanctuary. We look forward to seeing you again in person, but we will continue to worship online. We will continue to offer uh, this option as well for those who still do not feel comfortable coming into the sanctuary. This evening at 7 p.m. we will also be gathering, weather permitting, at Meeting House Springs Cemetery for our evening Vesper service, and we invite you to join us there at 7 p.m. There will be no Vesper service next weekend, Labor Day weekend, but then we will be back at Meeting House Springs for the rest of the month of September, but we will be moving those Vesper services back to 6 p.m so that we're not worshiping in the dark or almost dark. And we invite you to worship with us uh, for the rest of the month of September if you are interested at Meeting House Springs. Finally, I will be on vacation for a portion of this week, and the Reverend Bill Beck will be here to lead worship next week on September 6th. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice together and be glad in it. Please join me in the call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Let us rise and follow our living God.
God is ever more ready to hear and to forgive than we are to pray and to confess. God knows our needs before we even ask. Let us join together in prayer as we confess our sins before God and one another. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses, and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength, through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn only Christ? And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Behold, the old life is gone, a new life has begun. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Amen. in all the tasks 
that they imposed on them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And from the New Testament today, from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. Jesus again foretells of his death and resurrection and invites his disciples to take up their cross and to follow him. Matthew 16, beginning at verse 21. Listen again to God's word. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man has come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. probably heard the saying, it's all in who you know before. Connections matter after all. Think about it. Having someone who knows you, someone who can vouch for you, can open up all sorts of opportunities. It can open the door to a job interview or smooth the way for a bank loan or facilitate admission to a good school. You might think this seems a bit unfair. Well, what if I don't know anyone, you ask? But chances are, at some point in time, you benefited from knowing someone. Someone who helped you just because they could, or because they expected something in return. Sometimes pastors fall into this category, it's all in who you know. Martin Copenhaver is a pastor from New England, and he tells a story when he was a relatively new pastor, an associate pastor in a small town in New England, and he stopped to buy gas one morning on his way to the office. Now this was in the days before pay at the pump, and so after pumping the gas, Copenhaver got distracted by something and got back in his car and simply drove off, headed to the church office, forgetting to pay. Later in the day, he received a phone call from the police, asking if he had been at the gas station that morning, and suddenly the memory all came flooding back. He remembered everything that happened that morning, including getting distracted and getting in his car without paying gas. He begged the police officer on the other end of the phone for mercy, explaining that he simply had been distracted, but the police officer was not amused by any of this. 
There had been a, a string of thefts at gas stations in town recently, and the police were determined to put a stop to it, to arrest someone, to assure the public and the station owners that something was being done. But when the officer found out that Copenhaver was a pastor, he relented. He told Copenhaver to go to the gas station immediately, that he would meet him there and they would try to sort it out. And before he hung up, the police officer said to Copenhaver, and you better look like a minister when you get there. Connections matter. It's all in who you know. But there's also some danger in that system. Because there's no guarantee that who you know will remain in position, a position of power or authority. Part of the danger is that they may lose power, and then what happens? You're stuck. The other danger is that you begin to take for granted that who you know is all you really need to succeed. And then suddenly a new king comes to the throne who no longer knows you. That's what happens to the Israelites in Egypt. They've been living peaceably in the land of Egypt for generations after Joseph's death, and they continue to tell the story of Joseph and all that he had done for the old Pharaoh. And while they've been in the land of Egypt, they've grown strong as a nation and filled the land of Egypt. There's even more Israelites than there are Egyptians, the text tells us. And then all of a sudden, boom, a new king comes to the throne. One who didn't know Joseph, one who has no idea who Joseph was or what he did for the old Pharaoh. And suddenly, the Israelites find themselves in an unexpectedly vulnerable position, pushed out, oppressed, instead of favored replaced. If it's all in who you know, then the Israelites now find themselves in an unknown position. The new king looks at the Israelites and does not see them as friends or allies, but as threats and pests. Their population has grown and they are powerful. But they are different from the Egyptians. You see, the Israelites, they only believe in this one God, and they, they practice circumcision as part of their covenant with this God. And these foreigners living in the land of Egypt suddenly become a threat to traditional Egyptian society and safety. And the new king is afraid. He's afraid of what might happen if the Israelites gain much more power. He's afraid they will rise up against the Egyptians and maybe take on some of Israel, some of Egypt's enemies and ally themselves with them. So the Egyptians, they decide that they're going to enslave the Israelites. They set taskmasters over the descendants of Joseph and his brothers, and they conscript them into forced labor. The Egyptians forced the Israelites to build supply cities, Ramses and Pithom, according to the text. Some scholars believe these are sort of like supply depots on the Egyptian frontier. And then the new king even goes a step further. He instructs the Hebrew midwives to kill all the baby boys born of Hebrew women in order to keep the Hebrew population under control. And absolutely none of them None of it looks good for God's people. This is what happens eventually in the who you know system. Your worth as a person is no longer inherent. Your identity is contingent on who you know and the power that they have. There's no such thing as equity. People are commoditized and functionalized and eventually, as we see in this text, dehumanized. Now that there's a new king, 
who neither knows nor cares who Joseph was. The Israelites go from being allies and friends to hated enemies in the blink of an eye. They become slaves who are expendable. Lose one, there's ten more just like him waiting in the wings. And the Egyptians, they totally succeed at dehumanizing and oppressing their old friends, their old neighbors. The kind of oppression that we encounter here in the book of Exodus reminds us that it's so easy to oppress someone when you don't actually know the people who are being oppressed. The new king doesn't know who Joseph was, doesn't care at all what Joseph did for Egypt, saving them from the seven years of famine. He may have heard the stories, but they're essentially meaningless to him. So the Israelites are no longer known, are no longer valued because of their relationship with Joseph. Instead, the Israelites, they just become this nameless, faceless mob. They aren't neighbors to be loved, but competitors to be controlled, enemies to be feared and defeated. The who-you-know economy is alive and well even today. Think about the advantages of going to college with well-connected alumni or the importance placed on networking with people of power and influence. The push to get ahead by any means possible is alluring for so many people. A few years ago, even Billy Graham, before his death, admitted that one of his regrets in life was at times being too involved with politics. Being that close to power was a great temptation, he said. I would have steered clear from politics, Graham said in an interview with Christianity Today. I'm grateful for the opportunities God gave me to minister to people in high places, he said. People in power have spiritual and personal needs like everyone else, and often they have no one to talk to. But looking back, near the end of his life, he said, I sometimes crossed the line, and I wouldn't do that now. The who you know system is so tempting. Those who benefit from it often work hard to sustain it. And the system, as I said, is alive and well today. But in God's kingdom, that system is turned upside down. It's God, in God's kingdom, it's not about who you know. Instead, it's about who knows you. And it is God in Christ who knows you. It is God in Christ who knows you and loves you. The great prophet Isaiah writes, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Listen to those words. I have called you by name. I know you, and you are mine. God calls us by name. In the book of Revelation, we learn why God created us, and it's for God's pleasure. It's not because God needed us for anything, but it's out of God's good pleasure. God made us for himself. Paul puts it like this in his letter to the Ephesians. He says, we are God's handiwork. In other words, we are his workmanship, his masterpiece, according to one translation. We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to 
be our way of life. The who you know system is alive and well today, but Jesus, Jesus trades in an entirely different economy. He operates in a completely different system. For Jesus, our worth as a person is inherent because we are created and loved and called by God. For Jesus, our identity is not contingent on who we know. Rather, our identity comes in baptism, when we are welcomed by God as a part of his family. Our value as a person has nothing to do with the people we know, especially the people in high places. Instead, it comes from the one who is in the highest place, God our Father, who knows us and claims us and names us as his own by faith. Jesus invites us to participate in God's kingdom, to repent and believe the good news he invites us to do this not because of who we know, but because he knows us and loves us and wants us to love him as well. Jesus invites us to become his disciples, to meditate on God's word, and to be his followers who live in the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. To be a disciple of Jesus, then, means ultimately to know Christ, to know him as Lord and Savior, as teacher and healer and friend. To be a disciple means to know him as well as your friends and your family. It means spending time with him in prayer and praise and study of his word. It means serving as Christ's hands and feet in a broken and hurting world. It means standing up to falsehood and evil. It means putting the needs of others ahead of your own. And yes, it even means suffering. Jesus said, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. What an invitation. What an invitation. For those who want to save their life will lose it, Jesus said. And those who lose their life for my sake, they will find it. Knowing Jesus does not mean that you will have a lifetime of happiness and ease. Because following Jesus leads ultimately to the cross. But do not be afraid, because Jesus has gone ahead of us. He has gone to the cross ahead of us. And thanks be to God, the tomb is empty. He lives again. To be a disciple of Jesus means knowing Jesus. It doesn't just mean knowing about Jesus. It's not just facts and figures about the Jesus of history, but actually knowing the living Christ who transforms us. He is made known to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he invites us to be his disciples, to be part of God's kingdom, to take up our cross daily and follow him. The invitation to God's kingdom it's not like wrangling an invitation to an exclusive party, calling on someone that you know who can get you in the front door. It's not about who you know. The invitation to God's kingdom is about God knowing you and loving you and welcoming you to a place at the table in Jesus' name.
Let us affirm what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As God's people, let us join our hearts and minds together as we pray. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you know, God, that our hearts are restless, that we seek after all sorts of things to fill us up. Help us, O oh Lord, to seek after you find fullness in you. Speak to us, Lord, that we might remember that you call us by name, that you claim us as your very own in the waters of baptism, that your love for us is never ending. Speak to us, Lord, that we may hear your voice, that still, small voice calling to us in the night. Lord, we gather as your people, but we do not gather together in this sanctuary. We are grateful, Lord, that in the coming weeks you have made a way for us to gather again. We pray, Lord, that as we are able to begin gathering again, that you will be with us and keep us safe. Lord, you know how difficult these past months have been for so many of us. There has been loneliness and fear and isolation. There have been so many people who have lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods. Lord, comfort those who are struggling. Enable us as the church to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world, that we might bring salt and light and hope and peace and joy to people who are fearful and lonely and struggling, people who need to know of your presence and your love. Lord, we pray for this community, for those who are struggling, for those who are hungry, for those who do not have a home. We pray for students as they are returning to school, just as we pray for teachers and administrators and for all those who are trying to keep our children safe. Lord, bless them. Give them your peace and your mercy. Help them, Lord, to know what is right to do, to bless these little ones, to give them the education that they need and deserve, and to keep them safe and healthy as well. Lord, for those who are in need, for those that we do not know, for whatever need there is, we pray, Lord, that you would surround them with your care. Remind them of your love. For those who are sick in mind or body or spirit, Lord, be with them. For those who are struggling, Lord, be with them. For those who are doing well, Lord, let us rejoice and give thanks look for ways to give back. We pray, Lord, for
for our brothers and sisters here in this country and all around the world, for the Presbyterian Church in Honduras and for their food ministry to hungry people. We give thanks and pray. For the National Evangelical Synod in Syria and Lebanon as they respond to the Beirut explosion. Lord, we give thanks and pray. For the Church of Jesus Christ and all its many different expressions all over the world, we give thanks. Thanks that we are a part of it and pray that together we might serve as Christ's hands and feet. Lord, in all these things, we lift up our prayers to you, the prayers that have been spoken and the prayers that are still in our hearts this day, O oh God. We lift them to you, praying in Jesus' name, as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On behalf of the church session, we give thanks that you have continued to so graciously and generously support the work of First Presbyterian Church. Even though we have not been able to meet together these months, the work of the church continues. We still have bills to pay and obligations to meet, salaries for staff that are paid, and mission pledges that have been paid to our mission partners, both here and in other parts of the world. And so we give thanks to you for your generosity and invite you to continue supporting the work of the church. You can continue to give by simply sending your donations to the church or dropping them off at the church office, or you can use the online giving option on the church website. Simply click the Give Now button and you will be taken to a secure website hosted by the Presbyterian Foundation where you can give to the work of this church, God's church. Thank you for your generosity care. Let us pray. God of all goodness and grace, receive the gifts that we offer, and grant that our whole life may give you glory and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people, love, and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.